Hello, and welcome back to the Security Metrics Podcast. My name is Jen Stone. I'm one of the principal security analysts here at Security Metrics. And here at Security Metrics is in Portland. We are um, talking to a lot of the people who are participating in the PCI community meeting uh, for North America in Portland, Oregon. Very excited to have two guests with me today on a very interesting topic. And I, let me let me say the things, I'm going to read it so I don't get it wrong. Harley Geiger, uh, counsel at Venable LLP, and Lana Cohen, chief legal and policy officer for HackerOne. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Do you want to tell people a little bit about you and the where you work just a little background sure i'm happy to do so but thank you really for inviting us we're really happy to be here um so yes i'm alana cohen i am um very proudly at hacker one where we help create um we help companies and the government establish vulnerability disclosure policies and bug bounties so that we can help identify vulnerabilities before cyber criminals exploit them. Um, I got here in uh, through a variety of different means, but uh, I got my start in national security and I was um, in the White House Counsel's Office for the Obama administration and then also in the, as the General Counsel of the Office of Management and Budget where we handled quite a few, unfortunately, cyber breaches. Yeah. So it's really nice to be able to take that experience and and bring it to Hacker One, where um, you know, like I said, we we both help companies, but also help the government. So I'm a very mission driven person. So it's really nice to be able to assist the government in that way. Great. So thank you for for sitting down with me, Harley. So I'm Harley Geiger, and I am an attorney with uh, Venable LLP, where I focus on cybersecurity, uh, incident management, and compliance. I also lead the Hacking Policy Council. Uh, which is a group of uh, companies and individual experts who work on vulnerability disclosure policies, bug bounties, penetration testing, and hacking law. And I got my start uh, in the civil liberties community, actually, uh, working on privacy and surveillance um, and uh, worked on the Hill for a couple of years where I started working also on computer crime and cybersecurity and then worked at Rapid7, a cybersecurity company in-house for about seven years before joining the law firm. Oh, well, terrific. So you guys have uh, so much knowledge and experience. This is exciting to get to talk to you. We've tossed around the word hacker here several times already in this conversation. And I, I just want to tell you, I go to DEF CON every year, um, whether I like it or not. <laughs> I do like it, but there's a lot of people. And so sometimes that's a little overwhelming. And one of the big topics that that is kind of evergreen there is people will call someone a hacker with a negative connotation where a lot of people who consider themselves hackers do not consider it a negative connotation. And I was wondering if maybe you could kind of break down the difference between hackers and cyber criminals and maybe offer some clarity there. Well, they both wear hoodies, <laughs> the hackers and the cyber criminals. Okay, they that's both, valid. They, they both think they're really cool. They are. Yeah. Um, they, they do. All the hackers um, are. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, I mean, really, the uh, so first of all, completely agree that there is there is an, an important distinction. I think that there, I'm, I'm optimistic about the, uh, the the perception of hackers as not all being cyber criminals. Right. I think that is changing. Um, but I am also, so I, I also go to DEF CON and, you know, and work with the, with the community. Um, outside of the community, I still get surprised by how many people don't make that distinction mm -hmm. and do attach fear to the word hacker. Um, and Probably because of pop culture. Yes, I think that's a. I think that's a lot of it. Um, and they watched war games one yes. too many times. Mm -hmm. well, well, and the media. <laughs> I think. I think the media, not, not just pop culture. I think also when the media reports on these things. Oh, uh -huh. um, There was a long period there where uh, they, the media did not make that that distinction. Right. Uh, neither did law enforcement. Mm. Right. And so mm -hmm. that that became uh, something that I actually think the community has made a lot of progress on, oh, good. Uh, particularly as it relates to to government. But. Um, differences between the two, uh, some important ones. Um, one is that uh, people who are hacking tend to do so uh, for uh, the purpose of strengthening security, mm -hmm. right? And that, that is their, their end goal. Uh, whereas cyber criminals in general, they want to be paid, right? Or they're, they're mm -hmm. intentionally causing some sort of a disruption because of another agenda like um, you know, social activism, you know, or, or even a, a nation state geopolitical agenda. Um, so, number one motivation mm -hmm. that can be kind of hard though to really discern right. what a how do you motivation how do you are, can we read minds and know what really ma motivates people you know is that their intent or maybe some of them say what their intent is and their motivation yep um, and a number of them are accidental discoverers right um, so 
another one though is if, if you're a company and you're you're learning about a vulnerability or you're being contacted by a hacker how are they talking to you mm. right are they yeah. when are they going through a channel that you have established to have these kinds of conversations um, we call those vulnerability disclosure policies yeah right and um, or are they you know reaching out on Twitter are they are they deliberately not using the channel that you've set up um, so the way that they've approached you another really important red flag is uh, is money Right. In the end, uh, if a cyber criminal has reached out to you, a lot of times what they want is is funds, and uh, and the way that that comes up and uh, the timing is important. So, a lot of times, if you are a security researcher, it's not that you don't necessarily ask for money, but you'll probably do it after you've disclosed the vulnerability. You're not saying, "Pay me, or I won't tell you," right. or "Pay me, or I'll exploit it." Mm -hmm. Right. You'll disclose it, and then you'll say, "Hey, I could use five hundred bucks," um, and, and that's not necessarily wrong. It's not best practice to pay them, um, but that that the timing is, is what matters. Okay. Um, Whether there's an or else or not attached. Exactly. If there's an okay. or else, then it looks like extortion. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, uh, and there's, there are other differences, but these are three big ones. Um, is whether or not the, uh, the the hacker has exfiltrated a, way more data than they need, or has disrupted mm. your system, mm. you know, or has caused some other kind of harm. Okay. That is usually a big red flag. So he talked an awful lot about. Um, Vulnerability disclosure policies, mm -hmm. VDPs. Sure. Is this something everybody should have? Tell me, what are these? So vulnerability disclosure policies are absolutely something everyone should have. And there's a growing recognition that that's just an industry best practice now. Um, it's mandated for government agencies in the US. In Europe, it's about to be mandated uh, for a much broader community. And it's something that many customers ultimately do have because they see it as vital. In order to be able to, I mean, this research is happening anyway, right? Security researchers are already looking at your system. Mm -hmm. The question is, do you want to have a program that allows you to accept that information, deal with it, mitigate it, and then, you know, interact with the hacker in a positive light? Mm -hmm. or? Are you willing to sort of find out like everybody else on Twitter? Those, <laughs> in my view, that's in my view, the the sort of the choice here about whether or not you have a VDP or not. Okay. So what, is a, what does a VDP look like? A VDP can, um, is essentially a program where you, this is important actually, it's a program where you invite the public to report to you, okay. but you can't stop there. If you just invite the public to report a vulnerability to mm -hmm. you and you ignore that or you don't have a process by which you communicate with a security researcher who reported it, mm -hmm. then you do so at your peril. Um, you really do want to have both the mechanism to accept the information, but then on the back end, you really do need information. You need the ability to take the information in, assess it, assess the criticality of it, respond to it, mitigate it. Mm -hmm. And then um, you need to be able to have a transparent sort of timeline and communication with the security researcher. So they know that you're taking their information seriously, especially if you have a vulnerability disclosure policy instead of a bug bounty where there's payment involved. You do really want to make sure that you're giving the hacker the credit mm -hmm. for reporting it to you. If you have, if you're not giving a financial incentive, you do want to at least give them the credit that they might want to use with the rest of the community. Okay. And so transparent communications is really vital. All right. So, can you give me examples of of people who are doing a good job with a VDP? Well, the um, Hacker One obviously runs a number of VDPs for both the government entities as well as for um, for customers. One of our longest standing customers is the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. and they just announced the 47,000 vulnerabilities reported through the system since 2016. So they're using you as a third party for their... So we host the, the um, Department of Defense's program. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, we marry up the a customer with, we have 1.7 million hackers mm -hmm. who ultimately have signed up with HackerOne. And so we marry the two together and um, encourage reports through our system if they're a customer of ours. 
but uh, I don't think I just I don't want to worry off any cu potential customers who might be thinking of a VDP. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get forty seven thousand <laughs> vulnerability <laughs> reports that you have to. That sounds a little overwhelming. <laughs> People are just pretty excited to be able to say that they hacked the Pentagon. Oh, I can imagine. So that's uh, that's in part why they've had that success. But we really have success for multiple of our customers. We have. Um, you know, Zoom and Goldman Sachs and uh, many of the financial services, uh, the, many of the folks in the financial services sector, mm -hmm. Zebra, Visa, they have both, um, although they also have uh, bug bounty programs, mm -hmm. which I'm happy to also get into. Well, and you were mentioning something earlier, you know, what something about when and the money and how they ask. Mm -hmm. Is that really the, the root of the difference between like uh, VDP and a bug bounty or is it the difference between a bug bounty and a extortion <laughs> like what is well, I mean, there are several differences um but yes money is 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 a big one all right so for uh vulnerability disclosure policies um like alana said it is a it is a mechanism for receiving and processing and, and mitigating and communicating about vulnerabilities and generally no money is involved um, bug bounties, you are not just inviting uh, folks to, uh, to hack something, uh, there's also the promise of payment uh, if they find a vulnerability and that, that payment will depend on the significance of the vulnerability. But some of the other differences are um, a vulnerability disclosure policy is often something that organizations will sort of establish and it will be present over a very long period of time. And, uh, and it is just a, a foundational practice that if you find something, you know, see something, say something. Okay. Um, bug bounties tend to be more limited in terms of their time and their scope, or at least you can make it that way. You, so you have more control uh, just as a matter of practice over you know, what is going to be, what, is, what you are inviting people to hack, mm -hmm. right? So you could say, for example, um, you know, we, you are invited to hack our products, but you're not invited to hack you know, our customer profiles, uh -huh. you know, something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, or, you know, we are going to have a bug bounty program that will last for a, a year or even a couple nights as, as just a live hacking event um, and, and not longer. And so there is it, the scope tends to be different for bug bounties than for vulnerability disclosure policies as well. OK, interesting. You had some good VDP examples. Do you also have maybe some bug bounty examples? Yeah, I mean, we actually, Harley mentioned uh, some of our live hacking events. Um, those have traditionally yielded just remarkable results. We just did one in London for Zoom and for Salesforce, and they were extremely happy with the results that they get. This is like we invite a little elite group of hackers to come in and just have a dedicated 24, 48 hours in which they're looking for everything and anything that they can find um, in the system and then report that out. But more often, our, our uh, bug bounty programs are much longer in time you know, there's no, it's often not time bound at all, actually. Okay. They want they want the information whenever the information becomes available to them, right? And as the, as the company rolls out new products, mm -hmm. they're ultimately interested in continuing to get vulnerability data. Okay. And if they host, if they have the, um, if a customer had a program on HackerOne, a bug bounty program, we would help them assess uh, sort of how much they should pay for a vulnerability. Uh, you don't want to be totally out of the norm. Again, mm -hmm. if somebody asks for something uh, for a moderately, uh, you know, or something that's not critical, mm -hmm. then I think, you know, you know that it's not necessarily in good faith. So you want to make sure that you're paying out a, a standard amount for the type of uh, vulnerability and the severity. Okay. A couple other Good differences that you just brought up about um, asking, right? So asking researchers to to hack your 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 products, your systems. You know, um, the vulnerability disclosure policies don't always have that authorization. Um, in fact, a fair number of them don't. Uh, they'll just say, if you find a vulnerability, you know, this is where to disclose it. But they don't say you are hereby authorized to look for vulnerabilities in our system. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but some vulnerability disclosure policies do. The federal government right now. Um, all civilian agencies are required to have a vulnerability disclosure policy. And all of those civilian agencies do, in fact, provide some authorization uh, to, uh, to look for vulnerabilities and to disclose them. Um, bug bounty programs always give that authorization. Um, it is uh, that's that's part of the you know part of part of the setup, um, and right. it's usually you know pretty clearly described what your the scope of your authorization is. Um, VDPs it can vary. Interesting. And so when we take this back to the the PCI world, 
um, uh, disclosure um, uh, of any kind wasn't really defined in 3.2.1. But 4.0 is full of new and exciting things. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make you like, I'm sure you have not memorized this language. No, we did. Oh, did you? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe Harley did. Did you really? Well, we we presented on it this morning. Yeah, we did. Oh, okay. Well, tell me about the the new requirement then in 4.0 for this? Well, there's a couple things. Um, so there is a uh, there, there is a requirement within uh, 4.0 for mm-hmm. uh, multi-tenant service providers. Yeah. And so for, and, and I, I frankly, I did not know what those were. I had to look them up, um, but they are things like SaaS companies, yes. uh, web hosting providers, um, and another, like a lot of cloud service and, providers. And honestly, there's a lot of people who don't know what, what is meant by multi-tenant. And so, right. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not just you. This is something that is a lot of people, a lot of merchants never get to the A.1 mm-hmm. um, requirements because they're not multi-tenant. It's not super common. Yep. But um, please continue. Oh, well, so there, um, so what 4.0 uh, says about that is, um, is that those multi-tenant service providers have to have a way of allowing their customers mm-hmm. to disclose vulnerabilities or cybersecurity incidents to the service provider. Right. Um, and this is kind of a form of VDP, it's, but it's not, you know, when we talk about a vulnerability disclosure policy the way that we have been, it's not really, you know, open to the public, right? Mm-hmm. It is, it is it, what it requires is just the customers right. to be able to, to, uh-huh. to disclose that, which is, I mean, also like pretty common standards language, you know, contract language, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, but, but not quite a VDP. Now, that being said, I mean, you could have a public facing vulnerability disclosure policy that is um, that your customers can also use. You could fulfill it that way. Um, but that's one of those areas that I think PCI, believe it or not, is not uh, not necessarily keeping up with some of the other developments that we see in best practices and regulation, which are increasingly tilting towards requiring vulnerability disclosure policies as a, as a matter of best practice. Now, I also learned, I would have no idea otherwise, uh, <laughs> as a part of doing our, our presentation this morning, that there are other uh, standards that PCI does that uh, actually do um, much more explicitly require a VDP. Um, Beyond so, the PCI DSS, exactly. which is the one that you know most of us have heard yes. of because it's merchant related, so there's a lot of them. Yes. But there's, like you said, there's a lot of other standards put forward through PCI. They've been busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, um, and again, I, I sound like I know this really, really well, but it's really because of this presentation that, that I now know this, but the uh, the mobile payment on COTS mm-hmm. or MPOC standard, mm-hmm. um, as well as the 3DS, and I don't know what the 3DS means, but 3DS secure software It means 3DS. <laughs> so when I think 3DS, I think of the Nintendo system. So. Not. Is that what I mean, we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. No. <laughs> um, yeah, just the Nintendo system has Nintendo. to have a VDP. Um, so the but MPOC and 3DS uh, SSK both require uh, organizations to have a public facing vulnerability disclosure process. Okay. Um, so uh, so they have to be able to intake vulnerability information or cyber incident information from uh, from a variety of sources, um, and it can't be uh, it has to be protected. Like it can't just be an email address. It has to be without more encryption. Otherwise that's not sufficient. Harley mentioned that uh, there are requirements to have uh, VDPs and that the government is one of them. And it's it's hard to imagine that the government could be ahead of the curve on anyone <laughs> in this area. But in fact, in 2020, they issued this guidance that said all government agencies have to have VDPs or vulnerability disclosure policies. So we're hoping that maybe I know we're still we're just rolling out 4.0 here um, and uh, in in this next year, but we do hope maybe that 4.1 could potentially have that same standard, and that also uh, before that is ultimately accomplished, that perhaps uh, you know PCI could issue some guidance that specifies the importance of VDPs and then the you know the the way that one could. Uh, ultimately roll that out. And you know, one of the things that I've noticed about PCI, the, um, the, the Standards Council and the, the development of standards, is that over the recent years, a lot more um, involvement has been requested. You know, help us develop yeah. this. Help us know what's important. And so maybe by raising awareness and, and bringing that conversation to the council, that's something that, that could be considered because we don't all know everything. Right? Sure. And so living in the world that you live in, you know, wh- where you you're thinking of these things all the time, it might help um, frame that and bring that forward to the to the next version. Yeah. And we saw that actually um, 
which is, you know, a testament to the council that they work with, uh, you know, they collaborate and partner with industry to make sure that they are getting out uh, appropriate standards to the community. Um, we saw that with pen testing, that was an, a, like a great partnership with the industry. And right. so we're hoping we'll have something, be able to do something similar here. Yeah. So you said there were a couple. There is in, one more. Okay. Yes. Um, so in, there's another part of DSS 4.0, mm -hmm. um, which has, it's a control family six. Um, so on vulnerability management, and there is a, a control within that that requires organizations to uh, have a means of learning about new vulnerabilities. Right. And um, and and there again, it doesn't it, it doesn't really prescribe a means, um, but it does mention in guidance that bug bounty uh, bug bounty programs are one way to for organizations to learn about new vulnerabilities. Right. Um, and I would add onto that, you know, bug bounty pro programs as well as vulnerability disclosure policies. Mm -hmm. Both of them are ways to learn about vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, you know, and there again, like that's a, a good area I think for for clarification right. um, and, uh, and and guidance. Um, but yeah, so it's it, for the first time, you know, these these concepts are being sprinkled into uh, PCI DSS, mm -hmm. um, and they're more they're more explicit in some of their other uh, program standards. And and so uh, as a QSA, um, really. Conversing with customers about the difference between a bug bounty program or, or how you disclose or these this has not been part of the standard conversation and So I know that I have been behind on the VDP concept and how it how it compares to a bug bounty program or you know other ways to disclose um, From a PCI perspective. I know that in um, HIPAA there of course is breach disclosures that are very clear, but that is a law as opposed to a standard, and um, which I, I, I wonder if that maybe affects things in, in certain ways. But uh, with your experience in, in, um, in Washington, D.C. And, mm -hmm. and the development of laws and being part of that, um, what do you see coming down the pipe in, in terms of laws and disclosure ne necessity and across the board, not just in PCI? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're, uh, this is, as I mentioned, just a commonly accepted best practice now. VDPs are required for the federal government, and as a result, uh, we're starting to see interest among uh, members of Congress to make VDPs mandatory um, in, in a broader group. So for, in the IoT Cybersecurity Act, uh, they, uh, they mandated VDPs for, uh, for certain contractors under that bill. Um, but we just saw uh, Congresswoman Mace um, from South Carolina introduced legislation. HackerOne worked uh, with, as a subject matter expert with her office on this bill um, that would mandate uh, VDPs for all federal contractors. And that's because it's really important if you're going to shore up the security of the federal uh, systems, you really need to make sure that there are appropriate controls and, and uh, programs in place to, uh, to shore up any contractor that has access to those systems, since that's a pretty easy entry point. Right. So it really is to in order to make sure that both the contractors themselves are safer, but also for the entire federal ecosystem. Okay. So a lot of us know there are breach ob ob obligations. If there's an actual breach and there is a, you know, information has been lost, there's obligations that have to happen. But sometimes we don't focus on post- vulnerability disclosure obligations. Can you speak uh, to that at all? Sure. Um, there are, so there, there's a few distinctions here. So when we talk about breaches, often what we mean is a data breach. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about data breaches, often what we mean is uh, personal information. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so yes, the, every state, as well as a lot of regulated industries, finance, healthcare, um, what they're focused on with breach notification is personal information. Um, but there are increasingly more regulations and requirements around reporting cyber incidents, even mm -hmm. if personal information is not involved, mm -hmm. as well as sometimes obligations on what to do if a vulnerability is found or if a vulnerability is exploited. So um, if a vulnerability has been exploited, 
uh, that sometimes will meet the definition of cyber incident and you have to report that incident, uh, sort of depending on what, uh, what industry you're in. There are uh, it, a growing patchwork of cyber incident reporting obligations. So uh, the financial sector has all of them through their regulators. Uh, NYDFS has one. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, just released a rule that requires cyber incident reporting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, uh, so there's uh, uh, quite a lot of them. It's it's the, the, the timelines range from sometimes within a matter of hours that you have to report to uh, to several days, like four days. Mm -hmm. um, so it is an active discussion right now how to make those a bit more consistent, more standardized. Um, part of the issue, though, is that we're seeing this also happen internationally. Right. Um, so Europe has uh, uh, increasingly cyber incident reporting obligations. Um, and uh, there is, as you might imagine, there's, there's a lot of uh, contention around uh, at what point does the, the presence of a vulnerability or even an attempt to exploit the vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, should that really be something that we report every time? Like, wouldn't that you know, fill the reporting system with... You know, too many reports. You know, a bunch of bunch of uh, sort of garbage notifications. Um, and and if, if a vulnerability is exploited, is it does it have to be bad enough to report? So that that trigger is is under hot contention. But I think the takeaway should be that uh, you know organizations should consult with their legal counsel to help make that distinction. And their legal counsel should be working with the security team to help assess the severity of, of the incident, and see whether or not it tr triggers that legal obligation. So, you know, not just about data breaches anymore. Right, right. And, but it seems like a lot. I mean, any one organization, let's say you have a, an e-commerce business, it seems like they're hit with all of these requirements um, and, and legal things. How, how do they comply and how do they know what applies? And um, like you said, you, you know, you have that's what counsel is for. But um, in your view, is there any foreseeable future that, that kind of brings these cyber security um, regulations and privacy regulations together in a more co cohesive manner? Or is it really just a bit of chaos right now? I think it's still a patchwork, and I think it'll remain a patchwork for some period of time. I mean, we both because we have, uh, you know, the states proceeding in the way that they will proceed and the federal government doing its own thing. Um, and then, of course, you have the EU, uh, as Harley mentioned, uh, Right now, the Cyber Resilience Act, which is in draft form but pretty close to being final, has certain reporting obligations that um, are in contrast uh, with you know what the U.S. might require. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to make sure that you hire very good cybersecurity uh, lawyers like mm -hmm. Harley, <laughs> um, and uh, and that you are paying close attention to the different standards. Yes, Jen, the future is chaos. The future. <laughs> I'm so relieved to hear that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, so uh, what, what Alana, I completely agree with what Alana said. Uh, I think the idea of... Especially uh, the part about him being a good lawyer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, that's, yeah. Not, that's fantastic. <laughs> okay. the federal, privacy, federal privacy legislation has been uh, under discussion for uh, like two decades yeah. now. And uh, at, at, at two decades ago, when mm -hmm. we were first started talking about this, um, I think the argument was, Congress, you should do this because privacy is going to be a problem and we don't want to have a patchwork of state laws. And um, I, I, I and recall, you know, at the, at the time, you know, industry was reluctant about about whether or not this was a good idea mm -hmm. that now the dynamic has changed. Industry wants a comprehensive federal privacy law, and it is Congress that is reluctant to pass something sure. because now the states, their constituents have all now you know, voted. They've all acted. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's going to be very difficult to see a comprehensive privacy law uh, that is passed by Congress that um, that is really meaningful. Uh, on cybersecurity. Well, it's difficult to have any meaningful legislation in Congress these days that has like a, a, a real holistic approach because it's just not what they're focused on right now. So it's mm -hmm. and it, it and and getting everybody on the same page and even what words mean. So I'm part of a public private partnership in the healthcare space, and we spent weeks discussing what's the definition of privacy and what's the definition of security. Mm -hmm. And when when you don't even have a foundational common set of of language around something that um starting place hmm. it it, be, it makes it difficult to, to bring laws into it because what do these words mean how do we how do we look at them and and is there even a a, a foundation for a one size fits all i mean that's one of the reasons i do love the nist um standards 
I, I think they've done uh, and continue to do just an excellent job in in creating an understanding of a comprehensive cybersecurity program. But absolutely. Um, but it, it can be difficult to know exactly what do we disclose and when and how. And it's hard to know where to look, right? I mean, yeah. so you mentioned NIST on VDP, actually, because the government mandated it for itself, they turned to NIST and said, tell us what a good VDP looks like. Mm -hmm. Give us the components of that. And now they've done that. And the, um, you know, there are many in the industry who are using that as a reference point. The legislation that I mentioned earlier, the draft legislation, it would ultimately require that any VDP policy that is uh, adopted by a federal contractor follows that standard because it's a best practice. It is, and it seems sensible to, to, to take that approach. Then, of course, you add Europe on top of that, you know, so because NIST really is a, a U.S. focused, U.S. developed standard, although there are places beyond the U.S. that, that use it. Yeah. But there are other places that say, no, we want to use a European standard, you know, so you get the 27,000 ones and, and beyond, you know, those those sets of things and, and others. So finding a a common way to approach these things, I think it's going to take a lot. Well, I think on on vulnerability disclosure policies, we do have a couple sets of uh, popular ISO standards that Europe and the United States seem to follow as best practices, including NIST. So mm -hmm. when NIST came out recently with their publication on uh, guidelines for vulnerability disclosure policies for federal agencies, and they referenced those standards. Right. Uh, the legislation that Alana just mentioned uh, references those standards, mm -hmm. and Europe uses them also. Mm -hmm. um, I think where we see a lot more divergence is uh, is actually in other areas outside of vulnerability disclosure policies. Oh, interesting. Um, and if I, you know, for your listeners, if you're not paying attention to the Cyber Resilience Act, you should really pay attention to the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, that I think is going to have a GDPR-like effect okay. on cybersecurity. Uh, where you know we will uh, we will be affected by it here in the United States mm -hmm. uh, because it is an extraterritorial application mm -hmm. and it is really comprehensive and there are parts of it that are that are good I think from our perspective mm -hmm. um, so they they require vulnerability disclosure policies which we think is good for the ecosystem and there are parts of it which are very troubling um, including the idea that you have to report any actively exploited vulnerability to a variety of EU government agencies including prior to mitigation mm. so it's That's a a rolling list of software That'll packages. That'll stress people out. <laughs> software packages that don't yet have a mitigation that could be shared, depending on yeah. depending on the final version. But it's pretty advanced. But it could be shared with dozens of EU government agencies with not a lot of restriction or oversight in terms of how they're used. Which is why people would be stressed out about it. Because if that gets out, then the bad guys go, oh, hey, look. We know how to get in there and, and actively exploit this vulnerability. So. And it makes the government agencies a very rich target. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's a very tempting thing for the government agencies to use. Well, this has been hefty and somewhat um, depressing. As but so. the question <laughs> you asked, though, had a positive answer. Because yes. you said, what about the divergent standards? And mm -hmm. here, actually, for once, they're they're pretty consistent. Well, I, I, I Good point. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm trying it. to find the silver lining for you. I'm guessing a lot of your... I don't want to black pill everybody. <laughs> I'm, getting a I'm guessing a lot of your podcasts have some pretty, you know, uh, serious news for folks. So yeah, at least we have something positive. We, yeah, we have a wide um, range of people who listen for various reasons to various topics. I think this was is going to be something that a lot of people want to know more about. So I really appreciate you coming and talking to me. But before we wrap it up, is there anything we missed or anything you want to add on? Anything exciting coming? Or? You know, I, I think we just covered some of the, something uh, that you know, at least I consider exciting. Um, but uh, but it, uh, on, on the positivity, right? So yeah. I, I do think that it is very positive the the way that uh, security researchers are being integrated into mm -hmm. uh, I think into the security landscape. Yeah. Um, and I think that is a sea change from where we were ten years ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way that we kicked off this conversation was how people are sometimes afraid and don't always make the distinction. But I think that there has been a great deal of improvement in in that area. Terrific. Um, I think that researchers, like their, their contributions are increasingly valued. Mm -hmm. And I think that we as a, as a society um, rely on them to some extent for sort of independent market surveillance of, yeah. of products. Um, I think the trick for a lot of companies, a lot of organizations that are on the receiving end of that research is figuring out ways to work with them. Mm -hmm. And that's really what VDPs and bug bounties are about. Excellent. I'll leave you with one statistic, if I may, sure. which is that the average payout for a 
bounty on our system is about a thousand dollars. Okay. Whereas the average cost of a breach is about four and a half million. Oh. So I would just encourage your listeners to please <laughs> consider that cost benefit analysis, and then when they're done considering it, they can call they Hacker can call One. Hacker One. Okay. Yeah. And Hacker One has an excellent reputation. I'm so Thank glad you. that you were able to to be here today and and you as well harley thank you very much for your time thank you so much for inviting us yeah thank you thanks for watching to watch more episodes of security metrics podcast click on the box on the left if you prefer to listen to this podcast it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms see you on the slopes